Okay, so now we have the second part of the uh, lecture and we are going to talk about more practical part which is the agarose gel electrophoresis. So first of course we want to load our gels before we run it. So what we do, we actually fill the tray with a buffer and you know the running buffer is TAE, it is 1x. It should be covering the gel and should fill the wells of the gel. So if you look uh, from here uh, on the gel, you will see something like this. So these wells are the, uh, the places that we are going to load our samples to. So the level of your TAE should be above it so that when you put the tip uh, the uh, the tip is actually um, putting the uh, the samples inside the wells okay so because we are using the loading die the samples will not float away so if we don't use the loading die they will just float everywhere now because they are kind of bound to the uh, to the glycerol they will stay on the bottom of the well okay so these are kind of loading die so the agarose gel because of the um, mesh like structure it will create a lot of burden for the DNA to move through so if you look from the above so let's say it's your gel with wells and imagine it to be a mesh so something like this and the DNA should really put a lot of energy to move through so in this case the lighter or the molecules with lower molecular weight they will move uh, faster first of all because they are smaller in size. Second, because um, it is easier to move something small uh, because it requires uh, less energy. So in this case when we move through this gel the lighter ones will run further than the heavier ones and of course the heaviest ones will barely leave the well. And here you should know that the uh, negative pole is usually colored black while the positive pole usually colored red so don't mix them up because if you do the other way around your DNA will move in the other direction so it should work uh, it should move from minus to plus so here we start the electrophoresis and it's usually called gel run uh, so the the uh, procedure itself. Sometimes you might hear something like gel runs or just runs and it means that we actually ran these gels. Okay, So what you do, you close the lid and by closing it you connect this connector to your electrodes and then through this connector it's connected to the power supply. So after you plug it you will want to set up the power supply and usually for DNA we set it up between 100 and 130 voltage it should be constant and uh, for different sizes of the gels of course the running time will be different but the general rule would be uh, almost the same always so you have a gel and of course it has the length so let's say it's 7 centimeters and if you really want to see a good separation of the bands you will want to run it so that the visible die will travel not more than two-thirds so let's say it's two-thirds and your die, the loading die, should not move further than the two-thirds why? because whenever you have the small uh, fragments of DNA because they are very light and they don't require a lot of energy they will move very fast 
and just imagine that wh when you have this loading die coming to this end you already lost the smallest fragments of DNA so to prevent it you would want to uh, have this loading die move only to about two-thirds of the gel uh, when you really know that you're going to work with very small fragments of DNA you would want to increase the percentage of the gel so from one you can go up to four of course when you have four percent gel it's very sticky I mean very solid from the beginning so it might be very very hard uh, I actually used uh, the highest percentage I used was 3% and it was already solid when I was pouring it inside the gel form. So in the end of this run you will have nicely separated bands of your DNA and you will see them as uh, different pieces of fragments. Okay, so what are you going to do next? You're going to analyze your stained gels and first of all of course you are going to determine the restriction fragment sizes then you are going to create the standard curve and you are going to uh, create it by using the DNA marker uh, or DNA standard and in the lab it's called HIN3 so this HIN3 digest is the DNA standard for this lab Okay, so then you're going to measure the distance that the, uh, the DNA traveled from the well. Okay, so you're going to start counting uh, from here, so it's going to be a zero, and then count your band. So let's say you have 12 millimeters here, and you're going to write it down. Then you're going to determine the size of DNA fragments according to the DNA standard that you have and after that you're going to identify the related samples so in our experiment oh, so we had six wells so first well was loaded with HIN3 digest then we had crime scene, then suspect 1, 2, 3, and 4. Okay, so here you can see the sizes of the pieces. So uh, in total you will have six pieces of your DNA standard. So the heaviest one will be 23,000 base pairs and it should travel uh, the, uh, the appropriate amount of uh, centimeters. So let's say that it traveled 11 millimeters. Uh, then this, the next one would be uh, 9,400 9, base pairs and it will go further for 2 millimeters and so on and so on. So what you do, you determine your uh, standard curve for the samples. So let's say that you have three bands and you know that they traveled so let's say first one traveled uh, 20 millimeters this one traveled 22 and the third one traveled 24 so in this case you could tell that okay so the third band is actually 2000 base pair long but how do you determine the um, the molecular weight of the second and the first bands so what you do you actually create the um, HIN3 digest uh, graph so you write it down like this, so for example here you have the distance of 11 millimeters and its molecular weight would be so 10 here then the next one would be 20 30, 40, 50 etc. up to 
10, uh, up to 100,000. So from here you take approximately one third because it's 3,000. So between this 30,000 and this, a third would be around 3,000 base pairs. And you're going to draw it. Next you're going to take the 13 millimeters, which is here and it is going to be 9,400 so what you actually do here you identify 9,000 which is here so it's 9,000 and between these two values uh, you will draw the second point then you take the third bond from the HIN3 which is 15 millimeters so you draw it on this 15 millimeter border and its molecular weight is 6.5 thousand so you identify the 6.5 which is uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and right in the middle between 6 and uh, 7 which makes it roughly here then you take the 18 millimeters and it's going to be on this line and 18 millimeters is 4.4 thousand and it is 2, 3, 4 4.4 is somewhere here which is this guy then you are taking 23 millimeters and 23 is on this line 23 is 2.3 thousand 2 is here and 3 is the third of the second section so somewhere here so this is 23 and finally we have 24 millimeters which is um, 2000 so it's right on this line so intersection of two lines okay so this is your standard curve so what you do next so uh, you already can say that the third bond of your sample is 2000 base pairs uh, so what you do next you take 22 millimeters which is 24 23 22 and you drop the perpendicular to your uh, to your standard curve and then draw the same on the y-axis and in this case you identify it as more than 2,600 so let's say it's 2.8 thousands so for your second band the molecular weight would be 2.8 thousand base pairs and finally you take the 20 millimeters which is here and when you drop it on the curve first and then on your y-axis it's going to be about 3.4 thousand uh, base pairs so 3.4 times 10 to the power of 3 base pairs so now you have identified the uh, molecular weights for your sample you're going to perform the same uh, calculations for all of your bands and then compare them uh, between so that you identify the crime scene and your suspects of course um, this is the exemplar values so when you do your own calculations you will be using the photos of the gels and of course the values of millimeters uh, uh, traveled from the well will be different so let's say this will be 8 millimeters this will be 11 etc etc the only thing that is constant here is these sizes okay so the sizes of the HIN3 DNA standard will tell you the uh, approximate distance that this, these sizes could travel to and according to this distance then you will be comparing your samples so don't think that this distance is actually constant. No, the constant is this, uh, this part, which is sizes.
Okay, this is how you identify the samples and the sizes of fragments. And now let's talk about the plasmids. So what is the plasmid? It is the circular DNA, usually found in bacteria, but scientists, they use it a lot in their practice. So if we have this plasmid and we insert some gene here, we can then uh, transfect the cell with this plasmid and this cell will produce this protein according to the gene sequence inserted in this plasmid, okay? So this is a very powerful technique and to use it you will need to know how the restriction happens so that you can calculate where to insert your gene, etc. So, um, because it's circular, the number of fragments uh, will will be changing due to the number of restriction sites. So let's talk about these three plasmids. So the first one is being cut by the PST1 um, restrictase and after cutting it actually produces three different fragments. One is 610, uh, 610 base pairs, another two are uh, 305 base pairs each. So on your gel, if you take the well here, it will be looking like this. So you see only two bands because these two fragments are the same, but by knowing the, uh, the actual construction or actual composition of this plasmid, you will be able to say that actually here in this band you have two separate parts of your plasmid. So next let's say you have the plasmid 2 and we are going to cut it with ECOR R1. It creates three different bands, so three different uh, fragments, sorry. So first one is 220 base pair long, the second one is 400 base pairs and the third one is 620 so if you take the gel so you have a well then you have the first bond which is 620 then you have 400 and finally you have the smallest one which is 220 what if the plasmid actually has only one restriction site so PST1 uh, as the restrictase here and we have only one uh, restriction site so on your gel you will see a single band and in this case the plasmid is cut and it creates the linear DNA so if you kind of rejoin it it will create uh, the same plasmid but now after the cut of the restrictase we will have a linear single linear DNA molecule of course if you know the fragment sizes you can calculate the total size so total here would be 220 plus 400 plus 620 which is uh, 1240 base pairs here you would have uh, 610 305 305 and it is 12, 10 base pairs. Uh, here on this one uh, you are not given at all, but the total would be the size of this band. And actually uh, if you have both linear and plasmid DNA loaded to this well, they will travel the same uh, distance from the well, because they are actually the same size. So let's say the total here would be 1200 base pairs. You could also have the uh, representation of the task as the table. So let's say that you are given the plasmid cuts by the, uh, by the restrictases separately. So let's say that HIN3 cuts it to a piece, a single fragment of 1200 base pairs which means that it creates a linear DNA and the total of this oops, 
total of these uh, plasmid would be 1200 base pairs mm. so it means that it only cuts once for ecr one we have two uh, restriction sites and they will look like this for pst1 we have three restriction sites and we obtain something like this and we actually know that the total is the same for all of these drawings because then we have the combined action of all three restrictases here uh, what we could obtain after we cut the the restriction sites of this plasmid so here you can see that hint 3 gives us a single uh, piece of DNA but it is linear so if you take the PST1 it goes first to about a half then uh, one uh, two six of the of the uh, total and then one six of the total ECR1 uh, gives you a huge part of 800 and then a smaller one of 400 but we also know that we have smaller parts so 10 is here then we have 100 here uh, then 200 is actually from the PST so here we would have 210 this guy would be the longest one which is 390 and we are only left with this one which is about 290 base pairs so in this case you would be able to map your plasmid in a way that you can work with and of course uh, this is very rough representation of this uh, plasmid mapping so when you get to the lab where you perform this type of research uh, you will be given the uh, sites like here so let's say that we have the plasmid 5 you actually know that there are three different restrictases that could uh, cut the, the plasmid 5 and you know that ECRI has 1 and 2 2 um, restriction sites while the HIN3 gives you also 2 PST1 gives you 3 restriction sites and by knowing the points uh, on the plasmid you can calculate the the fragments and their sizes so you know the total which is uh, 1440 base pairs and you know that the restriction sites are at different places so let's say this is zero so first fragment uh, is the uh, sum of 150 and this small guy so 440 1440 minus 1420 gives you 20 base pairs and then you have this uh, 150 and 0 so 150 minus 0 which is 150 so the first fragment between hint 3 and uh, ecr1 is 170 base pair long so this is first so second would be 440 minus 150 and it gives you uh, 290 base pair long so third would be 619 minus 440 and it gives you 200 uh, 179 base pair long so fourth fragment is 710 minus 619 and it gives you 191 base pair long fragment 5 is 
1100 minus 710, which gives you 4390 base pair long. Six fragment here gives you 1329 minus 1100, and it gives you 229 base pairs. Finally, you have the seventh fragment, which is 1420 minus 1329, and it gives you 191 again. So, if you need to draw this uh, gel here, so this is a well, then uh, the biggest one is uh, the fifth fragment, then we have the second, so 293rd, then we have fourth, fifth, and these two guys would be the same. Okay, so when you draw these, uh, this gel, it will look like this. One, two, three. So one, two, three, four is like this. Five is seventy, so it's very close. Then we have six, which is the same, so ninety one. Here we have 390, then 290, 229, 179, 170, and 91. So this is the representation of your plasmid digest after we run the gel. Okay, so this is the end of the uh, today's lecture, and thank you all for listening.